Pastor Kinsley Okonkwo is an author, relationship coach, public speaker, and the founder and leader of the David Christian Center, DCC. He is well known for his powerful preachings and messages, especially when it comes to modern day relationships. He is an author who has written a series of books like One Thing, God Told Me to Marry You, Should Ladies Propose, and many more. Pastor Kinsley Okonkwo was born on the 29th of January in Lagos State and hails from the eastern part of Nigeria. Pastor Kingsley Okonkwo is married to Mildred Okonkwo, who is the co-pastor at the David Christian Center. Now with a loud ovation, let's make welcome Pastor Kingsley Okonkwo to the Ministers and Leaders Forum 2024. Ministry, in case you are here, you are not a pastor. It, it doesn't matter because ministry is also a kind of business. Um, Jesus Christ said, I must be about my father's business. So um, business doesn't only mean um, financial profit. Do we understand that? Anything you are doing that you want to make progress at is a kind of business. In fact, the way they say, anything keeping you busy is what? Business. Hallelujah. So... Um, Feel free to apply this to whatever it is that you're called to do because as a leader, you will have peculiar um, uh, challenges or experiences. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about, talk, we're talking about build to last. That's what we're talking about generally. And I'm generally going to go into how, you know, um, your marital relationship can affect how much you last um, in a relationship or your, in your business if you ask me any day, any time, what is one of my biggest secrets, I will tell you very easily, it is who I married and how I married, or how I'm marrying, because we're still on. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Many people do not consider it a major part or ingredient to success, but statistics show that for a lot of successful people, they usually have a successful marriage. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So whether you are single or married, these things are important to you. These things are important to you. Hallelujah. Um, I usually say everywhere I go that God himself is very invested in marriage. God is very invested in marriage. If you're a wise person, anything God is invested in, you better be invested in. God is very invested in marriage. <clears throat> I always say that, that was the, marriage was the first institution God himself started. That shows that in his mind, he believes that marriage is what will shape this world. It was the first thing he started as an institution. If God felt that education would have changed this world, it would have made Adam a professor. The first thing he made Adam was a husband and a father. If God felt um, politics would have changed this world, that made Adam a prime minister or a president. The first thing he made him was a husband and a father. If God even felt that the church would shape this world, it would have made Adam a pastor. The first thing he made him was a husband and a father. And like you know, we mentioned now, I've been a pastor for close to 30 years. I love church. Everything about my life is church. So I didn't want to quickly agree that the family will rank higher than church. I believe, and that's what we have all believed, that the church is the saving grace of the world. That's what we believe. I've been a pastor for 30 years. But God said, no, that's not how the order goes. That the church is like a backup plan of what the family did not achieve. God is saying that the family always comes first. And somehow in our psyche, in our thinking, the family is secondary, even to pastors. Whenever you need extra time for something, it, you go and withdraw it from family time. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? The family always comes first. There are many, many, many pastors and bishops that are in love with God's wife. They love the bride of Christ. They are taking care of another man's wife and they are neglecting their own wife. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? The church is the bride of Christ. That's not your own wife. 
Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You have to take care of your own wife. In fact, God began to show me, when he began to show me that even the family comes before church, COVID pointed that out to us. During COVID, everything was shut down. Businesses were shut down. Schools were shut down. Airports were shut down. Restaurants were shut down. Even church was shut down. Only one institution could not be shut down. And that was family. That, that tells you that when push comes to shove, family will still stand. I know you love church. I love church. But things can happen. COVID showed us things can happen that they can lose padlock and lock the church. Things can happen that can cause that. But one thing everybody agrees must be respected. One thing that somehow survives is family. That is why when churches are persecuted, churches move to the homes. You can't stop a church in a home. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Some of the greatest churches of the earth will tell you that they grew their churches and they sustained their growth by home cell fellowships. I'm just trying to show you that the home front and the family front is not a secondary part of your ministry or business or whatever it is you do. It's something you must and should give priority. God began to tell me that the criteria to be a pastor is to run your home well. I thought it's the other way around. If you, are, if, you are, if, you are, if you are a strong pastor, your home will work. No. God said, part of what qualifies you to be a pastor is to be running your own home well. You know why? Because church is also a family. If you can't run a small family well, why are you coming to run God's family down? Is somebody getting what I'm saying? That is why we have abusive pastors that kill the sheep, eat the sheep, abuse the sheep. Your family is a testing ground for God's family that he wants to hand over to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's read from verse 1. So God began to show me the criteria to be a bishop is to run your home well. So the home cannot be a secondary thing. That's your qualification. 2 Timothy 3 from verse 1. Oh, um, is this 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy, guys? I think it's 1 Timothy, guys. Sorry. Um, 1 Timothy 3, guys. DJ, where are you? Yes, I always call the people that put scripture for me, DJ. Thank you, yes, 1 Timothy. So, see what it says, guys. It says, this is a faithful saying. Yes, I have my own. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he has desired a good word, work. A bishop simply means an overseer. So every pastor is kind of a bishop. Next verse. It says, a bishop then must be what? Blameless. The husband of what? One wife. Temperate. Sober-minded. Of good behavior. Hospitable. And what? I want all of us to read this verse 2 together. One to read. This your reading is not, I need energy. Let's just start. One, two, read. Blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Focus. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this verse. Let's continue. Verse 3. Not what? Giving to wine. Not what? Violent. Not what? Greedy for money. But what? Not quarrelsome, not covetous. Next verse. He said, one who what? Who what? Rules his own house well. Having his children in what? Subjection, permission with all reference. He must run his own home well. Next verse. Next verse. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house... How will he take care of what? God's house. If he can't run his own family, how is he coming to run God's family? 
Because I know the average pastor will be glad to attend a church growth conference, will be glad to attend a financing ministry conference, but many of them will not want to attend a marriage conference. For a lot of you, that's where your ministry is leaking from. You have all the church growth strategy except marriage. It's one of the criteria. They say if you, if you don't run your house well, you, how are you coming to run God's house? The average pastor or leader will never read a book on parenting. Because that doesn't matter. But who do you want to leave this business for? Who do you want to leave the ministry for? If you don't raise your kids well. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Next verse. It says, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Next one. Hmm. It says, moreover, he must have a good word, testimony, among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Continue. Likewise who? Deacons. In case you are here, you say, I'm not a pastor, I'm a leader. They put you to. Likewise, deacons must be what? Reverent. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. Next verse. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Keep on going. But let also first be tested and let them serve as deacons being found what? Next verse. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in what? All things. Let me see the next verse. Let deacons be what? Husband and one wife. Please let me pause here for one minute. There is a madness going on now in the body of Christ. People are pushing polygamy with scripture. It's becoming common. So you can notice, and they say, oh, it's only bishop that should marry one wife. They've called deacon now. If bishop should marry one wife, deacon should marry one wife, what should member do? I can't hear you. What should member do? Clearly. The reason why they are giving you the examples for the examples to be emulated. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Okay, but that's not today's discussion. Let me not dive into that. He said, let the deacons be husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. The same thing. If you're a businessman, you're a leader, they say you also have to rule your own house well. Listen to me, dear businessman. The business world is in, is in search for pastors. Not pastors from church. Oh. They need a pastor amongst them. The, the career world, the corporate world, are looking for pastors amongst them. So it's not until you preach from here, that office where you walk is your pulpit. Somebody said, wherever you're pulling people out of the pit is your pulpit. So if you are a businessman, that is your pulpit. If you are a career person, that is your pulpit. And this same thing applies to you. They said you must be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Same thing applies. Same thing applies. Now, the next thing I'm going to deal with Still from this scripture. In that scripture that we read, please give me that the verse I said I was coming back to. Where they mentioned able to teach. Yes, thank you. It said a bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and what? Able to teach. <laughs> when they were listing the qualifications... The only one that is relevant on the public and on the pulpit is able to teach. The rest of these things mentioned here, they are your private or everyday lifestyle. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Most pastors focus on able to teach. That's like one over ten. The other things mentioned here are your everyday life. And let me tell you the problem with this thing. Able to teach requires the anointing. Most people that, most of you have pastors, for instance, you know that teaching here, you are anointed to do it. The unfortunate thing is that the rest, there's no anointing to do it. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. 
That means teaching can come easy. Whether you pray or not, if you are anointed to teach, you can teach. Whether you fast or not, if you are anointed to teach, you can teach. But the other ones, there is no anointing to do it. That is why, that is where many people struggle. Because they are used to where the gift flows. They don't realize that the other ones are not gift. They are behavior that you must cultivate. Teaching is a gift. Somebody asked me one time in the UK, he said, she said, my, pa- my father is a pastor. He teaches prosperity, but we are broke. I said, there's no surprise there. The teaching one is a gift. He did nothing for it. It's God that gave him as a gift. I said, but you see that doing part. There's no gift for doing. That's one of the biggest things pastors have not realized. You have anointing to teach, but that doing, eh, you will struggle to do like your members. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. When it comes to doing, you're not superior to your members. The same way they need to love their wife, you too need to love your wife or your husband. The same way you as a wife, you need to respect your husband. There's no anointing for it. You will humble yourself by yourself. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So that's why many people are lagging behind because they want to ride on gifts. There is no gift for doing the word of God. There's no anointing for doing the word of God. You will do it hardcore. Like every member in your church. That's why you can preach prosperity and be broke. You can preach marriage and be divorced. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? You can teach prayer and have no results. Don't confuse the teaching gift with living the life. Two different things. One is a gift. The other is a job. You will struggle like all your members or let me say you'll be disciplined like your members to do it. There's no free pass for you because you're a pastor. There's no shortcut for you. You will manage your money like every other person. You will sow seed like every other person. You will use your faith to trust God for your needs to be met like every other person. The economy of the country will also enter your house like every other person. And everything you want to tell your members to do because the economy is hard, you will first do it. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Because this, uh, this, this, it has kept many pastors stranded. They say, why am I teaching? Now, when I preached it, there was strong unction. <laughs> when you came down, there was still no food at home. Because this one is a gift. You have to go home and go and do it like every other person. You have to go home and go and use your faith. That's why healing ministers can die of sickness. Because it's an anointing to minister. It's different from you dealing with sickness at home and standing on the word of God. Don't confuse the gift with the life. There's no anointing to live the Christian life. We grind like every other believer. We don't have a special grace for living. We have a special grace for teaching. They say he's able to teach. Only one thing is pulpit worthy. The rest are everyday life. See what they said? You must be husband of one wife. It will take wisdom for your wife not to live if you are in ministry. Husband of one wife. It will take wisdom for your wife to believe in your ministry. You know, there are many pastors that their wife doesn't believe in you. <laughs> he's a fake man. She knows everything he's preaching is not true. The, the most difficult person for you to impress is your spouse. Because anything you are preaching, they can confirm. <laughs> if it's true or not. Is, <laughs> is somebody get what I'm saying? You can't deceive her. If she's not happy, she's not happy. Pastor, one, one, one mommy Gio came on the altar like this and sat down. They said, mommy, what's wrong? She said she wants to marry the man that preaches here. They say, you're already mommy Gio. She said, eh, but the one that preaches here is different from the one at home. That the one that preaches here is very kind. It's very funny. It's very anointed. It's very godly. She said, the one at home is very mean. <laughs> it's a devil. Doesn't pray, doesn't read the Bible, doesn't talk like a Christian. That is this one she wants to marry. They have to be begging her. <laughs> is somebody catching what I'm saying? You must be temperate. There's no anointing for that. You will build it. You must be of good behavior. 
No anointing for that one. You must be hospitable. No anointing for that. And all the other things mentioned there. Only able to teach is the one that there is a grace that comes on you. There's an enabling of the spirit that comes on you to do. Is somebody catching what I'm saying? So what does this mean? What you need to learn is that God does not do management. Please, I need a face towel or something. I forgot. God does not do management. It's one of the biggest lessons I've learned. It's obvious, but we don't pay attention. God does not do management. <laughs> God is not a manager. God is a producer. He will give you, he will produce and give you. Managing the resources God gave you is your own responsibility. Your outcome of your life is not determined by what God gave you. It's determined by what you do with what God gave you. That's why when those guys had five talents, God didn't manage it for them. What happened next was dependent on how they managed their talents. The guy that managed five where got five extra. The guy that managed two where got, the guy that got, got, got one that didn't manage where they took the one he had. Nigeria is not poor because we don't have resources. <laughs> it's management. Mis <laughs> mismanagement. And if you look at all those European countries, they don't even have anything. Africa is, is heavy with natural resources. Pastor, I was thinking, imagine if Africa didn't have resources. If we are like this with resources, imagine if there was no oil, no gold in Ghana, no, no diamond in Sierra Leone, no, no resources. We would have been eating human beings by now. God does not manage. That's what you realize. You can pray from now till next year. If God gives you 10,000 naira, it is up to you to develop the wisdom to manage that 10,000 naira. God gives you 24 hours every day. It is your responsibility. You can pray for more time. It's part of the problem going on in the body of Christ. We are giving people the impression you can pray about everything. Unfortunately, that's not true. We need to move from the Elijah pattern to the Elisha pattern. Elijah is Elijah, Elijah of, of Tishbite. Nobody knows his father. Nobody knows his mother. He had raw power. Elijah was calling fire from heaven. Raw one, not Holy Ghost fire, the one we are calling now in Nigeria. Raw one, real fire. Heavily rugged guy. He stopped rain for three and a half years. But he had little or no management skill. Couldn't manage his energy. He got burnt out. One small woman trolled him on social media. One woman wrote a negative comment. He said, I'm going to die. God told him, sleep and rest. He said, no, I'm going to die. He quit ministry. Because he didn't manage it. See, God will give you 24 hours. He will give you unlimited anointing. It's you that will stop preaching. You didn't hear what I said? <laughs> he won't manage your anointing. No? If you want to preach 13 services, there's anointing on you to preach it. Just that when you finish, <laughs> you can die. If you think God is going to come and say, my son, that have preached enough. He's not going to do it all. He doesn't manage anything. He gives you without repentance. You want to lay hands on people from morning to night? Ah, the anointing will be flowing. You'll be healing the sick. Then when you're finished, you'll be the sick. All their sickness, they will put it together in the landing bag and give you. It's you that will go on vacation. The anointing won't stop. It's you that will break. Your, your, your flow and take a, a rest. He won't do it. He doesn't manage anything. If you want to preach seven days a week, you can preach. Just that you, you, after a while, you will no longer be effective. You will lose the opportunities that God will give you because you are overusing it. He doesn't manage anything. So I said we need to move from Elijah pattern to Elisha pattern. What's the difference between Elisha? Elisha was in business. Before he came to ministry, his mindset was very different. Because there are things you do in ministry you can't do in business. You know, in ministry you can spend all you have on his offering on Sunday. <laughs> you can spend all you have and come on the pulpit. I 
some people say the Holy Ghost is moving. The Holy Ghost is moving. If you have 5,000, come out. If you have 30, you can do other nonsense because this one is about to finish. You quickly raise money now and give somebody to go and buy this. You can do it in church. In business, you can't do like that. So Elijah was coming from running a business. He was, and when Elijah met him, he said, follow me. Elijah said, I have to go back and put structure. Elijah said, no need. He said, there's need. Because he had a different mindset, a management mindset. Elijah said, follow me now. He said, I can't follow you now. I can't, they don't do like that here. Calm down. I'm running business here. I should leave. I should just follow you. Without telling who is next. Without doing succession. Without telling them the plan. He said, wait. He went back to put things in place. See two of them when they had to deal with a widow. One widow was broke. Elijah said, give me the last one. And God will sustain you. <laughs> when they came to Elisha, a widow was in trouble. Elisha said, what do you have in your house? He said, you have oil. He said, go and borrow capital. Close the door. Pour it inside the capital and start to sell. The difference that one is sustainable. One will continue making money for the rest of her life. The other one, when Elijah goes... Hunger will still deal with her. We must move from the Elijah model to the Elisha model or else we we'll waste our opportunities and resources. You won't always be this young. If you don't manage, God won't manage. It's you that will manage. Manage your youth, manage your age, manage your time, manage your money, manage your opportunities, manage your relationship. It's you that will manage, not God. See, Elisha, when, she, when that woman built a house for him, he cleaned up the house and he stayed there and he was so happy and he said, he wanted to bless the woman. Do you see the statements he made? He said, can I talk to the king on your behalf? Ah, uh-uh. Elisha was politically connected. If it was Elijah, I know Elijah won't say that. Elijah would just, I called down 13 children that we can't take care of. Elisha said, what does this woman need? Should I talk to the governor for you? Should I talk to the president for you? That means as he was doing his prophetic ministry, he knew that there was a need to still be connected with the power brokers. The Elisha model is generally more sustainable. That's why they said Elisha did two times the miracles of Elijah. Definitely outlasted him. More effect. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? God does not manage anything. It's up to you to research, up to you to apply what you have learned, up to you. Thank God you are in a meeting like this, so you're already showing the right uh, signs by coming from events like this. Keep learning. God will not research for you. Just because you don't know something doesn't mean the knowledge doesn't exist. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So, with all these things, you need to realize, I was talking about marriage. That's the main thing I want to focus on. Because marriage and relationship in itself is one of the gifts God gives mankind. For those of you that are married here, except you had a good reason why your wife is not here. If you don't have a good reason why your wife is not here, you're already mismanaging. It's important to carry your wife along. She's your greatest asset. She's your only real church member. Ah, Jackpa has shown us that anybody can travel. Your associate pastor, that two of you are laboring the, together in the Lord. <laughs> He's laboring for his green card. One day, he will just tell you that, Pastor, <laughs> I'm going. Your real, authentic, forever church member is your partner. Your strongest business partner is your spouse. Yet, that is the place most people invest the least in. A church is like a bus. People are always entering, people are always coming down. The only permanent people are the driver and the conductor. Are you here, somebody? Those are the least permanent people. So you better treat your conductor well. <laughs> is somebody catching this, sir? 
So, there are seven purposes why God created marriage. God is so, so wise. There are seven purposes he created marriage. I can't do all the seven today. I'll mention just two. And I hope that with those two, you can get your life in motion. I say, whether you're business or whatever, seven purposes of marriage I'll mention two. Number one, why did God create marriage? I told you that's the first institution he started. Not school, not politics, not businesses. The first thing God created as an institution was marriage. It's not a coincidence. It's because there's, there's great benefit to it. Seven purposes of marriage. Number one, Genesis chapter 2, where the Bible, I think verse 18 or so, where it said, it's not good for man to be alone. He said, I will make for him a help meet. A help what? Meet. Mm. Thank you. And the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helper comparable to him. DJ, do you have amplified version or amplified classic? If you have it, I would like to get it if you can get it for me. In the amplified or amplified classic, he said, I will get him a help. Okay, let me see. It. He said, now the Lord God said it's not good, sufficient, or satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, meet, that is suitable, adaptable, and what? I can't hear you. And what? Complimentary. The first purpose of marriage is to compliment you. That's that word you are saying there, complimentary. Is to compliment you. Listen, the way human beings were wired, you come with certain strengths, and those strengths equal certain weaknesses. Are you getting what I'm saying? Oh, this will help you, pastors. You need to understand this, even business people. Your life will be radicalized. Your success will be multiplied if you can catch what I'm saying. Your strengths equal weaknesses. For instance, if you are very tall, it has advantages. You can't be very tall and very short at the same time. Is somebody get what I'm saying? There are days of life. There are challenges of life that only short people can do well. The day something enters a slim place, that's when you value somebody that is slim. Because nobody's hand can enter there except that slim person. You can't be very tall and very short. If you are very tall, there are advantages to it, but there are also disadvantages. If you are very short, there are advantages to it, but there are also disadvantages. So what I'm trying to say is that only you can be, can have strength in every area. What makes a, I'm a car enthusiast, some of you know this, what makes a sports car, a sports car, makes it a disadvantage on off-road driving. A sports car, for it to be effective, needs to be flat on the ground. The flatter, the better. That way it can make sharp bends. It can break through the air faster. But if you carry that flat car to mountain road, it can't, it, it, you pick the car in pieces. What makes a, a SUV, SUV is that it's very high, has big tires, it can climb rocks. If you bring that SUV into a racetrack, all those things are disadvantaged. Big tire, big, it can't move. It can't turn, if it turns sharply, it's going to somersault. Are you getting what I'm saying? So your strengths automatically spell your weakness. That's why God says it's not good for this man to function all in one. I'm going to bring someone that is complementary. That will balance him out. That's how one version puts it. So usually if your strength is making money, you might find out that you're not great at managing or counting money. If your strength is speaking, sometimes you will not be good at admin. Is somebody catching what I'm saying? God wants, that's why technically most times opposites attract and women generally attract. The strengths that men have also becomes weaknesses. And God, in his infinite wisdom, designed us to complement each other. Men are wired for vision. That's why if you're a man in the house, if there's any prayer, you must pray for yourself regularly. It's a prayer of vision. You are created for vision. 
What do I mean? As a man, they've scientifically, they found out that men can see better on a straight line than women can. Everything about a man is about vision. If you're a man, you don't have vision, then you are, you, are, you are almost not functioning as a man. Vision is what God gave men. That's why when the Holy Ghost came in Joel chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 2, what did the Holy Ghost do for men? He said, your young men shall see vision and your old men shall dream dreams. In fact, as a man, your eyes have more nerves than that of a woman. Men can see better on a straight line than women can. Your wife, of you. and all men's problems start with their eyes. David was having a great life until he saw his life change. Job was a bit smarter. He said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. When the Holy Ghost came, your young men shall see vision, your old men shall dream dreams. Whenever they included women, you will hear they shall prophesy. Because a woman's strength is in details and recollection. That's what prophecy is, reminding you. If you are, those of you that might be very good women here, one of the things you will notice that whenever you want to go on call, of course, your wife will tell you that this is not what you told me. God wired her for details. Women have unlimited, <laughs> unlimited memory. They don't forget anything. Men have zero memory. That's why when a man and woman are arguing, a man's favorite word is let's move on. <laughs> it's not because he's nice. It's because there's nowhere to store this problem. He can't even remember what caused the argument. Because his memory is very small. So anything you say, yeah, yeah, let's just move on, let's just move on. But a woman, what you did to her at 1982, you see, her function, her function requires her not to forget. A woman is an administrative machine. So that's why when you come for conference like without your wife, you are missing. There are things you won't remember. She will remember in this meeting. You must carry her. It's like coming to this meeting without your note. She will remember. God, she's for details and prophecy. Many men tell me, when they want to do something, they didn't tell the wife. He said, this is not what you told me. You told me God sent you to this church. <laughs> Which one is Canada now? I didn't. <laughs> she was like, you told me that you will build a 10,000 sister. Which one is Canada, Canada, Canada in your mouth? <laughs> Are you catching what I'm saying? She's wired for details. She doesn't see great on a straight line. But she sees better side on from her side. Most men don't know that women can see from the side of their eyes. In fact, most women don't even know that we cannot see from the side of our eyes. That's why when your wife is gossiping with you, she wants to gossip this couple here. She's looking here. She says, honey, see that couple? The man doesn't know that we're not supposed to look. He'll say, eh, where are they? <laughs> he will turn his whole face. He doesn't know that women can see from the side of their eye. I tell men all the time, every time you're sitting beside your wife or fiancé, and you're on your phone. Both of you are watching movies on your phone. She's reading your charts. She's watching straight, but she's reading your chat. You are going out by four. Yeah, okay, who are you going to meet? She's your chat. She's reading it. <laughs> because she can see from the corner of her eyes. Because those days, the early women were nurturers. They can have four or five children under their care. They can be looking straight, but they can keep an eye on all the children. And they are so detail-oriented that if any of the children are changing color or there's a mark in their body, she can notice. She's given the gift of details. It's her role that made them design her like that. So I know a church where women are not allowed to function. Everything is scattered. Because men are goal-oriented. They are future-oriented. They are picture-oriented. So they don't keep eyes on the details. Of course, there are some exceptions. There are some men that have details, some women have vision. That happens. But largely, most times, this is how it is. Women are gifted with details. Sometimes that details too comes with the problem of pettiness. Because they are picking details they should pick and the one they should not pick. <laughs> so that's why she can be restless and looks like she's troublesome. She's not troublesome. The information is flowing to her at a very fast rate. Is somebody catching what I'm saying? She can see from the corner of her eyes. So she's given the gift of details. You are, that's why a man has a binocular vision. He's, he, he can see far, but he can't see near. 
Nothing like a man that has a project. He will neglect every other thing. If a man is building a house, the children might never eat. He said, we are building a house. He's seeing vision. It's the wife that will say, but we need to eat today. She has the sense of vision and details. Is somebody catch what I'm saying? This is why sometimes a man is looking for his key. He has binoculars. Binoculars can see far, but can't see. He's looking for his key. Honey, where's my key? Where's my key? The wife will just come and say, see it here. Yeah. She might not see far, but details is her strength. So imagine two people come together. Thank you. If you're clapping, clap, please. Because I'm sweating. Is somebody catching what I'm saying? So imagine two people come together. One has the gift of vision. The other has the gift of details. That's what God designed. That you complement each other. I need a man and a woman to come on the stage. Preferably a couple. Is there any couple nearby? Any couple? Don't be ashamed of a couple. Anyone? Okay, there's, there's somebody coming. You come, you come. Ah, are you shy? Is she shy? <laughs> come on the stage if you don't mind. Come on the stage. So this is why, this is why God brings people that are opposite of each other. So this is why talkers, we always fall in love with listeners. Two talkers can't like themselves. If two talkers go on a date, they'll come back and say, that I didn't even enjoy it. That guy just a talk, talk. He didn't even ask me. Everything he asked me, he went aside by himself. He was talking too much. Two talkers can't like themselves. Talkers will always like listeners. People that are heavily driven will always marry people that are laid back. Two heavily driven people. If they marry, daughters, this girl very driven. She had like two PhD. She can speak like four languages. Very driven lady. She said, the guy that is interested in me is very laid back. I want another man like me. I said, if you marry another man like you, two of you, you'll be meeting at the airport. That we are the children. I don't know. I'm going to have a meeting. You have a meeting. <laughs> two of you can't be heavily driven. There will be a problem. When you see most marriages divorce and break up, it's things like that that happen. Two people with masculine energy have married. No one is submissive. A woman is generally agreeable. A man is generally aggressive. It's necessary for their survival. If a man is not aggressive, this world will, will destroy him. He must fight. But the woman is agreeable. Her survival is dependent on her agreeing with her husband. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So God designed us for our function. But when we come together, we become such an unbeatable team. Spenders marry savers. Organized people marry scattered people. Planners marry spontaneous people. Because there are some times in your life you need to plan. But there are other times in your life you need somebody that will seize the opportunity right now. So, God generally brings opposites together. So, two of you come. You stay here. You come this way. This guy, face the audience. This guy, his front is his strengths. His back is his weakness. When he's alone, his strengths are here. His weaknesses are here. He can be attacked from here. But when God brings him his spouse, face, face this side. Face, face. When God brings him his spouse, face that you come. Face the other way. Join your back with him. When God brings them together as husband and wife, this union now has just strength and strength. The weaknesses are still there. They are being covered by a strength. So when they come together as one, this entity now doesn't have that weakness. For instance, if he knows how to make money and she knows how to manage money, when he was alone, he'll be making money and be mismanaging it. Now that he has joined to her, now that they have money, the management part that he didn't have is being supplied by his wife. If you ask me any day what has been one of my greatest secrets of success, I will tell you for free, it is the wife I married. I had dreams. I wanted to write books. All the books were in my mind till I married. There are many of you here, you have books in your mind. All my books were in my mind. Today, I'm one of the highest selling Nigerian-based authors. Apart from the fathers, for instance, I'm one of the highest selling. Everywhere we go, people say, ah, people don't buy books here. No, I say, not my books. Not my books. My books always sell. 
Everywhere in the world I go. Is somebody catching what I'm saying? Everywhere in the world I go. Some years in books, we do 200, 300 K, US. Sometimes one year. I do well in books. But all those books were in the dream form. My wife read English in school. And she's good with writing. She's also fast with reading. So my books have been coming out since I married. When I was alone, they were in my dream. I'm a spender. My wife is a saver. I'm a spender. I spend faster than I make money. Some of you know you are in my WhatsApp group. We ball without budget. When you are making 10K, you are already planning an expense of 100K. That you deposit the 10K. You better change. So that's how I was living. And you know, when you're not married, you will not know your finances. I'm a, I'm a, we have a program we're putting together for churches. Because pastors I travel around the world. I discovered that a lot of churches are struggling financially. Because the members too are struggling financially. So we're putting together a package to train. We believe that every couple and every family can be rich. That's what we believe as a couple. Because we saw it happen in our own life. And we want to teach the principles God taught us. I'm the spender. And you know, everybody has a financial habit. Or a financial personality. You will know you, you know you have it because when you are alone, you are the CEO, chairman, board of trustees, treasurer, secretary. So when you approve any spending, even if it's a useless spending, oh, everybody will agree because you are the one signing for everybody. When you marry, you will start having to defend the expense. You want to buy a shoe. They say, what's wrong with your old shoe? Defend it. <laughs> That's when you will find that you have a wrong financial personality. I didn't know I had a horrible financial personality. I make money. You're making money wasn't hard for me. Keeping it was the problem. So I'm a spender. My wife is a global saver. Ah, saver. My wife doesn't spend any money. I've told Nigeria, stop borrowing from China. Borrow from my wife. No matter if there, no matter the scarcity going on, my wife has money. Those days when we got married newly, I would have finished all my money. I'll say, ah, honey, I'm, I need money. She'll say, how much? I'll say, 100K. she said, I have. I said, you have money in this house. I thought we were finished with the money. She has. Next day, the same thing. Next week, ah, I said, how do you always have money? Savers don't, savers price everything they don't buy. <laughs> have you met savers before? They say, how much is this in? 15,000. Say, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they will never buy. They save all their money. So one time, <laughs> I was almost becoming 40. Still making a lot of money, but never keeping it. Always broke. My wife said, this guy is going to be 40 soon. I don't want him to retire or get to his later years and not have anything saved. Don't you notice in Nigeria, whenever entertainment people or whatever, that used to rain one time when they are sick, they come and beg for public funds. It's mismanagement. I want to get people, some people to come and do seminars for them. It's mismanagement. Because you won't rain forever. <laughs> so... She said, this guy is coming 40 soon. I don't want him to end his life like this. So, God, and God told her, don't rebuke him. Don't correct him. Because some women, they want to confront their husband. He's doing something wrong. You think it's your mouth you used to humble him. I don't have time to go into that. But God told my wife, him. just whatever you want to teach him, project it, show him. So, she began to save for me without my knowledge. So, whenever money entered our account, she would remove some for me. And save it. I mean, I don't check her. I trust her with the money. One day, I don't know what I was checking for. And as I started seeing that, ah, somebody's moving money regularly from this account. I called my account person. She said, ah, because she too was in on it. She said, ask your, your wife. So I had to ask my wife. She said, not you know. I had to press her. So what's going on? She now finally said, well, God told me to be saving for you. I said, how much have you saved now? You are saving. How much can it be? You know, we people like us. You know, if you're in like, my category, you like big, big things. You don't spend much, but every time you spend one, the whole account, we feel it. I said, how much have you managed to save? When she told me the amount, I said, I can't believe I'm this rich. I said, you were able to save this amount without my knowledge. So imagine what will happen if I'm in on it. I said, let the saving begin. So before, I used to make money and not have money. Now, we have money. It's because of the gift that God gave me. 
And the beauty is this. Initially, the person will just be helping you, but after a while, the person will rub off on you. Because two of you can hang out for long. The talker, being married to the listener for 10 years, will start to listen more. The listener, being married to the talker for 10 years, will start to talk more. The saver, being married to the spender for 10 years, will start to spend more. The spender, being married to the saver, after 10 years, will start to save more. So at the end of every marriage, if it's done well, both of you come out better than when you entered into the marriage. But that only happens when you actually allow your partner to flow and to flourish inside your house. When you pay attention to your spouse. When you pay attention to your spouse. Because some people are married, like I said, you come for meetings like this, you leave your wife at home. Mm -mm. You read a book, you don't share what you read. You are not pouring into your spouse. I and my wife were flying from... Uh, Nigeria to UK on, on a Qatar Airways flight. And in the, in the seat, there's a demarcation between the two seats in case both of you are not flying together. So when we got there, there was something between us. So I called the attendant, how do we bring this thing down? The woman said, both of you need to press the down button at the same time for you to come down. So I said, how do you raise it up? It's only one person can raise it up. So it dawned on me that to build a strong marriage, it takes two intentional people. But to destroy the marriage, only one person. Only one person. What am I saying? If you guys are going to build a solid marriage, both of you must intentionally work on it. There are six other points, but my, I've already exceeded my time. But marrying right and marrying the right way will definitely impact your business and your ministry. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah.